Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm returning to Ultimate General Civil War. We are in the midst of a Union Campaign Let's Play that we started four episodes ago, where we're playing through the full campaign game as the Union. Uh, in our last video, we started the Battle of Bull Run, although I believe we did a book review, if memory serves me correctly. And I had intended this series to be more of a historical discussion series, where I'd be talking about the battles that I was fighting and, and the history surrounding them. Uh, Bull Run, I'm not going to do that, as it turns out, because I've got a different topic I want to talk about, but it is still history-related. So, in one of my earlier videos, we talked about... Uh, how the Civil War was about slavery. I got some feedback. People didn't like it. Some people agreed. It was kind of a back-and-forth situation. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was a bit of a pro provocative uh, episode. Um, I'm not trying to be a shock jock in terms of history. I'm not trying to be controversial. But I think the episode that I'm going to be talking about here today is we fight the second half of the Battle of Bull Run is going to be that. It is going to be somewhat controversial. And that's because I'm talking about Robert E. Lee. Yes, the commander, the famous commander of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia uh, for the majority of the Civil War. He took over command when Joseph E. Johnston fell at the Battle of Seven Pines in 1862 and would command the principal Confederate field army in the East for the remainder of the war. Robert E. Lee went down in history as one of the great captains of men, one of American history's best generals, uh, one of the iconic figures of the Civil War and of American history, and again, goes down as being one of our most successful commanders of all time. What I'm arguing here is he is also one of the most overrated commanders of all time. Now, I'm not saying Robert E. Lee isn't a good general. I'm not saying Robert E. Lee, or sorry, wasn't Robert E. Lee wasn't a good general. He was. He was a very good general. He was very capable. He was a phenomenal leader. What I'm really doing here is posing the question. I'm not even intending to say this is, you know, unequivocal fact. What I think we should talk about is does his record merit this sort of reputation of being in the pantheon of all-time greats in American history. And I think if you look at it a little bit more closely, you know, we may come down and we may say, hey, Lee was one of the greatest generals of all time in American history. We may still come out with that decision. But I think we should pose the question, is this true? Is it is it a fact? Um, one of the things, if you look at Robert E. Lee, uh, is often he's compared against Grant because in 1864, uh, Ulysses S. Grant was transferred, or transferred himself, from the Western Theater where he had been operating for the entire war in Tennessee and uh, Mississippi and, and whatnot, and transferred east uh, to fight in the Eastern Theater. He did not take direct control of the Army of the Potomac, but he was the de facto commander because he became the Union Army's supreme commander. And from 1864 to 1865, Lee and Grant would end up fighting one of the most Memorable and historic campaigns in American military history, the Overland Campaign, followed up immediately by the Siege of Petersburg and the eventual surrender of the Confederate Army at Appomattox. Many Confederate sympathizers tend to argue that Grant was not a great general. He wasn't a great captain of men. He didn't actually beat Lee in the military sense. He just knew that, hey, I can take a billion casualties and still win. I can march up front, take 20,000 casualties, continue marching, fight the next day, take another 20,000 casualties, and keep doing that, and eventually the Confederate Army will be bled white. Generally, Grant is often considered as sort of the Confederate, or the Union figure who recognized the realities of the war, recognized the realities of, of manpower, and decided I'm going to grind Lee into powder and that's how I'm going to win. And often people use that as a, as a form of derision against Grant because there's this sort of image, and it, and it came up in the Union Army as well during the Civil War, uh, that he was a bit of a butcher, that he, you know, he didn't care for his men. He sent them callously forward and was a modern general in the true sense, whereas Lee is often re re revered in this sort of Napoleonic sense of a commander of movement, of great action, of great tactics a tactical and strategic genius, while Grant was a genius of industry, recognizing, you know, what the situation of the war was. And really what I'm trying to pose here is, I don't think the two generals are as different 
as people think. Now, this isn't really an an analysis of Grant at this point. We may do that later on. But this is an analysis of Robert E. Lee specifically. And posing the question, was Grant really... If, or not Grant, was Lee really an elite captain of men? Was he truly a great general, or is his reputation somewhat fraudulent? So please don't get angry. Please don't yell at me in the comment threads about how I'm, you know, so obviously wrong. Uh, let's just think about it. Let, let's talk about Lee's record in the Civil War and see if he warrants being considered one of the all-time great generals, uh, as he often is. First of all, let's rule out the aspect of strategy, um, at least in terms of grand strategy, because Robert E. Lee executed some very fundamentally impressive operational maneuvers, uh, operational in terms of operational strategy, but he never was really a great strategist, and he's generally not regarded as such. He wasn't, you know, a grand general in charge of all the military forces throughout the Confederacy, at least not till the very end of the war. And his vision was always pretty limited to just Virginia. I'm not going to criticize him for this because this was his area of responsibility, but I am going to call out that we're going to, going to exclude that element, uh, which is often held against Lee. Uh, people often claim that he was not an effective uh, general in terms of strategy, but I'm, I'm going to forgive him on that because I don't really think that matters in the context of this discussion. What we're really going to talk about is his performance in campaigns from an operational perspective and uh, from a battle perspective. I'm also going to exclude Lee's performance in West Virginia early in the war in which uh, General McClellan uh, ran roughshod over Grant's department, or over Lee's department. Lee did not take the field in any of the battles in West Virginia. He was the department commander, but several of his forces were overrun early in the war in West Virginia, and his reputation suffered greatly because of it. Um, His failures to hang on to these territories in Western Virginia largely led to the pro-Union part of the state of Virginia being able to eventually secede from the Confederacy and rejoin the Union. But we're going to exclude that from Lee because that's generally not considered when people talk about Lee's greatness. They tend to talk about just his command of the Army of Northern Virginia. So what what about it uh, makes me feel that Lee is overrated? Perhaps makes me pose the question maybe more accurately in terms of his ability to command an army in the Civil War. Well, I think I don't think a lot of it has to do with any particular glaring flaws with uh, Lee as a commander. I think it has more to do with the opponents that he faced and the way that they responded to him. I don't see this tactical brilliance that often people credit with Lee. I don't see this uh, ability to overwhelm and destroy Union armies, as people tend to credit Lee, people tend to treat him as this old wily fox who always caught the Union off guard and nearly destroyed the Union army on several occasions. I don't see that being true. I see a commander who made a series of errors and repeatedly made the same mistakes time after time after time, and yet, until Grant, his opponents never called his bluffs. His opponents were never able to take advantage of these issues, not through Lee's own greatness, but through his opponent's own flaws. And as a result, there's no doubting that just based on results, and, and to be fair, that's probably about all you can do for someone is base, you know, evaluate them based on results. But based on, based on results, Lee was one of the great captains of the Civil War. That was more to do with the opponents that he faced, perhaps, that's what we're about to discuss, than any sheer brilliance on his end. So, let's take a look back. 1862. The Union Army under General George B. McClellan has advanced up the James Peninsula in Virginia. They've taken Yorktown, and they've moved west. They're threatening the Confederate capital in Richmond. Just, actually, less than a year after the victory at Bull Run, and the Confederacy looks like it's on its last legs. About a year into the war, 
the Union army of over 100,000 men is within just a few miles of the Confederate capital at Richmond. And the Confederates notice, hey, the Union army is split. There have been heavy rains recently, and the Chickahominy River, which is just north and east of Richmond, is swollen. Half of this massive Union horde is cut off on one side of the river, the other half is on the other side of the river. Between them, a, f- a flooded river that is difficult to cross. Joseph E. Johnston, commander of the Confederate forces, decides now is the time to strike. Increasing pressure from Robert E. Lee, the advisor to President Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, and the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, is mounting on Johnston. You need to attack. You need to do something to arrest this advance. The Union have been advancing on Richmond for over a month, and not a major battle has been fought. You need to do something. There is nowhere else to retreat. The Union can see the steeples of Richmond on the horizon. And so Joseph E. Johnston launches an attack at the Battle of Seven Pines with the Union Army split by a river in poor weather. Johnston's attack meets initial success, but quickly devolves. The army is still largely green. The offensive orders are complex. The Union is able to rush reinforcements across the previously believed unfordable river via some pontoon bridges that are flooding and yet general sumner the commander of the second army of the or second corps of the army of the potomac says this bridge must not collapse and sends his troops across the river so the union saves its half of the army joseph e johnston is wounded and carried from the field and the confederate army's commander needs to be replaced due to injury Jefferson Davis, with no other options, decides, I'm going to go with Robert E. Lee. Prior to the war, one of the most well-regarded Union officers, or officers of the United States. His reputation has suffered at the hands of George B. McClellan after some uh, poorly executed uh, campaigns in western Virginia in his defense dealing with overwhelming odds. And from June 1862 till April of 1865, Robert E. Lee would lead the most storied army of the Confederacy in a series of battles which would build his reputation as one of the greatest generals in American military history. And yet, as I've already said, here today we debate, is that legacy valid? Is Robert E. Lee a fraud? Well, let's take a look at it. On the surface, the answer is most unequivocally no. Lee was a great commander. Lee fought a series of seven battles in seven days. Just a month after taking command of the Army of Northern Virginia, as he would call it, Lee launched a series of offensive attacks, six straight days of attacks, seven days straight of battles, in which he attacked a Union army of over 100,000 men with some 80,000 men of his own and drove it back from the Confederate capital saving Richmond. Shortly thereafter, another Union army advancing on Richmond from the north. Lee races north in a series of maneuvers outflanks the Union army under John Pope, gets a corps of his behind the Union army. The Union attacks this isolated corps. Lee rushes his other corps, it's a two-corps army, up to the aid. And as the Union are attacking General Stonewall Jackson on the site of the Battle of Bull Run, this being the second battle of Bull Run, Lee's other corps under James Longstreet swings in against the flank of the Union Army, routing it from the field. And thus, in June, May and June, and then in August, I believe it was, the Union had been dealt two crushing defeats at the Battle of the Peninsula, or the Peninsula Campaign, and the Battle of Second Manassas. Lee then leads another wide-flanking maneuver in an attempt to destroy the withdrawing Union army, though that fails, and then invades the North. Two dramatic successes, an incredibly successful summer in 1862, and Lee takes a success North. The Battle of South Mountain is a disappointment. The Union stumble across Robert E. Lee's orders and are able to gain his plans. They then attack him ferociously at the Battle of Antietam, and Lee holds on against overwhelming odds to just barely 
cling to the field of battle. He withdraws back into Virginia, checked but not defeated, and awaits what comes next. The Union commander of the Army of the Potomac, George B. McClellan, is sacked for not pursuing Lee more aggressively, and Ambrose Burnside is placed in command in 1862, late 1862, and he leads a desperate attack on the Confederates at Fredericksburg, losing more than 12,000 Union soldiers for only about 5,000 Confederates in late December of 1862. A crushing defeat for the Union, which launched a series of more than 13 attacks against a stone wall in an impregnable position. The Confederacy was never in danger. Burnside is replaced. General Joseph Hooker, well known as a fighting captain, put into command of the Union Army of the Potomac, marches aggressively in May of 18... well, April and May of 1863 now against Lee, leaving him into a battle where Lee's outnumbered by more than two to one, with one half of his army moved to North Carolina for scavenging operations. And thus Lee, with just one half of his army, once again leads a daring flanking assault led by his most trusted lieutenant, Stonewall Jackson, against the Union flank, crushing the Union army the following day, driving back the Union army from Chancellorsville and winning a stunning victory. Some 17,000 Union casualties to only 12,000 Confederate Hooker, driven back, and the South saved again by the brilliance of Robert E. Lee. 1863 progresses and Lee decides once more is the time to invade the North. Once more is the time to make this war a reality for Northern citizens. Relieve the strain placed on the state of Virginia due to the constant warfare and forging that's occurring there and take the war to the north. Lee outfoxes General Hooker, advances north into Maryland and then Pennsylvania. His bold advance leads to the replacement of Hooker with George Gordon Meade. Lee then launches a series of attacks, his army anyway, not him directly, against Union forces near a small town of Gettysburg. Flanking the Union Army out of their early positions on eighteen or on July 1st, 1863, driving them from the ridges outside of town, through town, and back to a series of ridges just outside of Gettysburg. He then launches a series of attacks on July 2nd and July 3rd, nearly driving the Union from the field, but unable to win that decisive victory. Unable to win that victory. And so... Gettysburg, the Confederates, they're checked. Not a decisive defeat, but checked. Certainly a tactical defeat. And Lee withdraws back into Virginia. 1863 isn't filled with much more aggressive action. Lee nearly goads Meade into a... um, you know, advantageous attack against the Confederacy, similar to Fredericksburg, but is unable to do it. And then 1864 begins, the monumental year of the war. General Grant moves from the Western Theater to the East and comes to the East to fight Lee. Lee fights a battle at the Wilderness, where once again the Union is outflanked by General Longstreet's Corps and nearly driven from the field. At the end of the day, the battle ends in a stalemate. Grant, however, outflanks Lee, marches toward Richmond. Lee responds, and for two-plus weeks, the Battle of Spotsylvania rages as Lee gets in front of Grant and stops his advance. Lee checks Grant, but only just, in a series of bloody battles. Grant then moves around Lee's army again to advance on Richmond, The overland campaign would continue for more than 20 days. Lee would miss a golden opportunity at the Battle of North Anna. Many suspect he may have had a heart attack. And eventually the Confederates would be boxed into a siege near Petersburg, Virginia, a key supply and railroad junction just south of the Confederate capital. If it were to fall, the Confederacy would fall, or at least the Confederate capital. And thus the career of Robert E. Lee more or less ends. There's the 
Appomattox campaign after the siege of Petersburg, but Lee's army is in no shape to effectively resist any longer. And Lee goes down as one of the great commanders in American military history, and how can you disagree? We just went through a series of great victories by Robert E. Lee. The interesting thing is Grant is often considered a butcher by many. He launched a series of unrelenting attacks in which he kept attacking the Confederacy in 1864, kept attacking and slowly bleeding them dry as he continued to advance on Richmond. Grant and Lee are more like each other than we suspect. Let's look at Lee's victories, should we say. And let's say, what were they really? Okay, the first one we talked about, the Battle of the Peninsula. More specifically, the Seven Days Campaign. Seven Days of Confederate Attacks. The situation going into the battle was General George B. McClellan was on the outskirts of Richmond, on the verge of victory. Robert E. Lee comes in and reorganizes his army and within a month is ready to attack. He does the exact same thing that Joseph E. Johnston did before him. The Union army is split by a river, swollen by rain, and Lee reasons he can isolate and destroy part of the Union army. The first of the seven days was actually an attack by the Union, but days the following six days were a series of Confederate attacks against the Union army under McClellan. Lee launched six, six days of attacks and failed on all but one of them. The Battle of Gaines Mill was a tactical victory as the Union was flanked and forced to withdraw, but outside of that, the Confederates met with defeat, losing almost a quarter of their army over six days of heavy fighting. Some 20,000 Confederate casualties, I believe, was the figure. The Confederates had about 80,000 men in their army, so about a quarter of their army was destroyed. The Union lost maybe one-sixth of their army, roughly the same in terms of casualties, but the Union army was bigger. The Union army won all but one of the battles, tactically, one of them decisively, the Battle of Malvern Hill, where Lee launched a frontal attack against entrenched positions against more than a mile of open ground, more than a hundred Union guns at the top of a slope, and the Confederacy just never should have attacked. It was a disaster. Yet Lee won. Because, at the end of the day, General George B. McClellan lost his nerve. It wasn't some brilliance on Lee's part that led to this victory. There's no doubt that he demonstrated skill in the ability to coordinate a large army in a series of attacks over seven days. But it wasn't a brilliant success. It wasn't a tactical success in any way. The Union commander just lost his nerve and left. Okay, well, I mean, the Confederacy got what it needed. It won the battle, but it wasn't exactly Napoleonic. Still, Lee knew what he needed to do to win. There's credit for that, but, but again... It wasn't a great military feat. It was a series of attacks on a conf Union flank, a series of what ended up being frontal attacks. Maybe it was his officers. Maybe they weren't ready. Maybe the experience wasn't there. What about his other battles? Well, the 2nd Manassas was a masterpiece. There's no doubt about that. Lee maneuvered around a Union army. As you can see, I just won the Battle of Bull Run, by the way. But at 2nd Manassas, Lee maneuvered around a Union army, outflanked him, led him into a battle, and then crushed their flank. Now, 2nd Manassas could be said to be more of a victory of a com combination between Jackson and Longstreet than Lee. Lee deferred to his principal lieutenants mainly for that battle. But we'll at least give him credit because the maneuver in the battle was all geniusly done. Lee outflanked the Union, turned them out of their positions, drove them north without fighting, eventually was able to lure them into an attack in which he was able to destroy their flank. So, through the seven days and through 2nd Manassas, if we're taking a tally, Lee won and his opponents won. His opponents lost one of those engagements, and Lee won one of them. What about the Battle of Sharpsburg? Well, actually, first, let's talk about the entire Maryland campaign. Lee invades the North, with a force far too small to accomplish much of anything. He divides his army, his orders are captured, and he's defeated and nearly destroyed at the Battle of South Mountain. No doubt maneuvering in this bold and aggressive way was inviting disaster, and he just barely escaped it. Definitely credit McClellan there. Granted, Lee could not have known his orders would be seized, but nonetheless, it was a defeat. A defeat that was brought on by the risks that Lee took. Lee gets the credit for taking the risks of launching a series of frontal attacks and winning in the Peninsula Campaign, but at, second, at the Battle of um, South Mountain, you certainly have to t say Lee was rash at the least, and his tactics did not pr prove successful. That led directly into the Battle of Antietam, 
where a Confederate army of just about 40,000 men, 39,000 specifically, was outnumbered by more than 90,000 Union troops and attacked in Maryland. The Confederacy held their own, fighting doggedly and determinedly. At the end of the day, only the Union's inability and unwillingness to commit more than 30,000 reserves to the battle saved the Confederate army from complete destruction. Nonetheless, it was nearly destroyed. However, McClellan's own caution came into being and saved Lee. Lee lost the battle, but he could have lost the war at Antietam. Through no thanks of his own, McClellan provided Lee a draw. So if we look at that, and we combine that with South Mountain, we have to say Lee performed poorly in the Maryland campaign. Lee won his opponents too. Second Manassas was followed up, or I'm sorry, Antietam was followed up by the Battle of Fredericksburg. No real brilliance displayed by Lee. The Union launched a series of frontal attacks against defensive terrain. The Confederates held their position. But where Lee messed up was he got caught off guard. Burnside maneuvered aggressively and caught Lee completely by surprise. Lee didn't know where he was, and eventually he found him on the shores of the Rappahannock near Fredericksburg, and yet Lee was caught completely off guard. If not for a mix-up in the Union forces where pontoon bridges weren't made available for the Union army, Burnside would have been across the river and on the heights before Lee could respond. I think despite the successful defense at the Battle of Fredericksburg, there was no brilliant tactical success there. It was merely taking a very strong position and following all the known uh, skills of the day to make sure it was entrenched and move forward. With that being said, I think you've got to give that to his opponents. He didn't win that battle. His opponents lost it. Lee won his opponents three. Chancellorsville. General Hooker takes command of the Union Army of the Potomac, and once again, Lee is caught completely by surprise. A Union Army of more than 80,000 men gets into his rear, sets up positions, and the only reason that Lee is able to win a dramatic victory at, at Chancellorsville is because his enemy loses heart, and rather than attacking his rear as the Confederates are trying to come up, sits back and lets the Confederates dictate the way the battle is going to be fought. As a result, Lee finds a hole in, in Hooker's flank and attacks it, drives the Union back, but inconclusively. The following day, a series of aggressive Confederate attacks against the Union caused the Union commander to lose his nerve. He withdraws. Not because he was defeated militarily, he wasn't. His flank was crushed on May 2nd, but May 3rd was the second bloodiest day of the war, and the Union held their own. They, withdraw, they withdrew by choice, not by force. Make it one to four. Lee's opponents have handed him four victories. Well, three, really. One defeat. His opponents have handed him three victories. He's lost once, and he's legitimately won through his own greatness once. Battle of Gettysburg. Lee marches north with more than 70,000 troops. His army is swallowed into an engagement he didn't want in a place he didn't want. He launches, his commanders, launch a brilliant flanking maneuver at the end of the first day of Gettysburg. It would be counted as a Confederate victory with bold and decisive maneuvering by Lee leading to that victory, except for the fact that July 2nd and July 3rd didn't go the Confederacy's way. Lee launches a disastrous frontal attack on the Union Army, on the third day of July in 1863, clinches a victory for the Union, clinches another defeat for Lee. His opponents, what is that, what are we at, 4-1 to one now? In, in favor of his opponents, rather than Lee. Inconclusive maneuvering occurs in the rest of 1863, and into 1864 we go, where Lee is assaulted mercilessly by General Grant. General Grant defeats Lee after the Battle of the Overland Campaign. Lee launches another brilliant flanking attack at the Battle of the Wilderness, but it's not enough. It doesn't have the momentum to win the battle, and it's another inconclusive Confederate attack. The Peninsula Campaign. Inconclusive attacks lead to victory. The Wilderness. Inconclusive attacks lead to victory. Chancellorsville. Inconclusive attacks lead to victory. The Wilderness. Inconclusive attacks lead to follow-on battles. And from there, Lee was unable to stop Grant. And therefore, my argument that Lee is overrated stems from the fact that in all but one of his campaigns, that being the campaign of Second Manassas, 
His victories can be ascribed more to his opponent's failures and his opponent's weaknesses than they can be to his own successes. Lee did not defeat the Union Army at the peninsula. Lee did not defeat the Union Army at Fredericksburg. He was caught off guard. Lee did not defeat the Union Army at Chancellorsville. His opponent withdrew on his own accord. Lee did not defeat the Union Army at Sharpsburg or Gettysburg. Those were defeats. Lee did not defeat the Union Army at the Wilderness. That was a draw in which he was unable to win a victory. And so Lee was a great commander, but he was aggressive. He was always attacking. A quarter of his army destroyed at the Seven Days. A quarter of his army destroyed at Antietam, actually a little bit more. A quarter of his army destroyed at Chancellorsville. A third of his army destroyed at Gettysburg. He took chances, but he didn't win battles with it. His opponents lost them. And that's the reason I'm arguing Lee might be just slightly overrated. I know I'm simplifying things. I'm not saying Lee was a bad general. I'm not saying that at all. That hasn't come out of my mouth once. What I'm saying is Lee is more similar to Grant than we give him credit. Grant, attack, attack, attack. We're stopped, move around the flank, attack again. That was Grant's style. That was also Lee's style. So what do you guys think? What do you think of my description and explanation of the battles that were occurring? What do you think of my evaluation of Robert E. Lee? Show me a tactical, brilliant success. Maybe, fine, let's give him credit for Chancellorsville. Chancellorsville, success. Fredericksburg, success, but lucky. Second Manassas, success. Okay. Seven days? I mean, that was his opponent beating himself. For sure. Wilderness? No success. Gettysburg? No success. Sharpsburg? No success. So this idea of him being one of the great captains of all time, maybe in inspiring his men, but not so much in actually, you know, winning battles. What are your thoughts? I've always been a big Robert E. Lee fan myself. But when you think about it, has anyone ever gotten so much credit for so few legitimate military victories on the battlefield? They were victories in the mind, but they weren't victories on the field. And it's interesting to think about. I'm sure I'll garner a lot of hate, a lot of discussion in the thread, but that's kind of the point of this video. I want to hear what you guys have to say. I want to hear what you guys think. Did Lee really deserve the reputation he has, or did his opponents give it to him? Because he was just one of the few commanders willing to do what needed to be done to try and win victories. I'm curious. It's not something that my mind is totally made up with. But anyway, guys, that's enough of me rambling. Let me know your thoughts below, and until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.